some of you who are here Wednesday. Some of this will be a repeat, but lest you think, oh, he's just going to repeat his sermon from Wednesday. It's like those commercials you see where they're trying to sell you something, and they have their big push, and then all of a sudden, but wait, there's more. Well, guess what? There's more tonight. No pun intended. Um, as we think about <clears throat> that the Lord is our protector. So, the Neshoba County Fair, uh, I grew up going to the Neshoba County Fair. My grandmother, that's not her cabin, but uh, it's similar to what uh, she would have had uh, back in the day. Uh, I grew up going to her cabin. Sometimes it would be an extended weekend. Other times, <coughs> the entire week. It was always hot, uh, especially when I was young. That was before she had vinyl siding put up. That's before she put paneling. That's before she put in air conditioning. Okay, it was hot. It was crude. It was miserable. And we had fun. All 13 first. Well, actually, some of the cousins didn't come along a little bit later. But the older, I was the second to the youngest of the first set of first cousins. So we, my cousin Lori and I usually got um, uh, picked on. However, it was fun, and it was uh, amazing, and, and I, I treasure those times. And, of course, um, one of the times, and I shared Wednesday night for the youth and children and adults who were here, how that, it was in, I believe, August of 1980, something amazing happened. These strange men in black suits with sunglasses and earpiece radios in their ear, you know, they're not blending in at all. Uh, they show up going door to door around the racetrack, um, Basically telling people that they were security for a very important VIP uh, person that was coming to speak. And they were the United States uh, Secret Service. And so we were told, my, my grandmother and I think my aunt and one of the others, my mom, I think was listening in on that conversation, that uh, for the cabins that had balconies, <clears throat> you were allowed to be out on your balcony. Uh, you could, you know, be watching, because uh, you could see the grandstand from where we were. You could listen to uh, what was being said, but <clears throat> that uh, you were not to make any sudden moves and not to make any threatening moves, because they were going to be standing there, and I promise you, they were packing heat, okay? And, and not because it was hot. I, they were packing weapons. Uh, they meant business. I'm like, who is coming? Of course, when they said that, it was basically my mom and a friend of mine that had, uh, was with me for that week or that weekend. Uh, they looked at us like, don't you dare. You know, don't you dare pretend that you were you know, uh, doing something and, and have us shot. And so uh, a little bit later, this motorcade comes in. I mean, just limo after limo after limo. And it was then Re Governor Ronald Reagan of California, who was by then the uh, uh, Republican president, yeah. presidential candidate. And of course, he spoke at a campaign rally. But he had, uh, as most uh, uh, professional uh, politicians do when they uh, are nationally nominated by their party, they had personal protection, the Secret Service, standing uh, between them and potential danger. And we're reminded of how that the Lord Jesus Christ uh, is our protector. And so I want to just begin uh, by reading Psalm 121. And I'm going to hit the two highlights from Wednesday, but then we're going to go in a little bit different direction. But for those of you who were not here Wednesday night, I just want to kind of set that stage so you have the feel uh, of everything that was said then. So Psalm 121. Psalm 121. As soon as I find it, we will get there. Get lost in my own Bible, but hey, there you go. Psalm 121, beginning with verse 1. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence come my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even far evermore. May God bless the reading of His Word. Just a few thoughts before we get into the, uh, the meat of what I want to look at tonight. That we are reminded that the Lord is a providential protector. That's in verses 1 and 2. Uh, that by creating all things, then the logic flows that he sustains and maintains all things. And as a result, we find our security there. We find that, that uh, his providence also protects us. 
that creative and sustaining power demonstrated by God in the past is alive and active today on your behalf and on my behalf, providing everything that we need physically as well as spiritually and everything in between. We find that in Philippians uh, you know, chapter 4, uh, how that we uh, can trust the Lord to supply not just some of our need, not most of our need, not 99.9% uh, .9 but you're up to that one point whatever percent left over, no, all of it. And that is His providence, trusting in His providence. God graced His people in the Old Testament by His, pres his presence, yes, and by His providence as He would protect them from all dangers, as He was bringing them through uh, out of Egypt and ultimately through the wilderness and into the promised land. I also shared with you Wednesday night how the Lord is a profound protector. At least three areas that we find this profound, that He will not allow your foot to slip or to be moved, that He who keeps you will not slumber. God has His grip of grace on each and every one of us. He keeps His eye on each and every one of us. And He never grows tired. There's never a time, uh, like earlier at the beginning of the worship service, I had to step out for a moment, uh, had to go check something and then come back. Uh, but there's never a time when God is in the room and says, oh, excuse me, I've got to get up and go check something. Y'all just hang on just for a minute. I'll be right back. No, God doesn't do that. He is on the throne and he's watching and he knows and he's got it covered. He will not allow your foot to slip. When you trust in Him as you are putting, uh, building your life on His Word, that doesn't mean that you don't have troubles. That doesn't mean that you will not have uh, mistakes. But it means that when you have those troubles, you have a rock that is higher uh, that you can cling to. You have that assurance that as Peter, when Peter is on the island of Patmos, and he is terrified when he sees the, the risen and glorified Jesus Christ, and it's that hand that touches him says, Fear not. It's the same hand that reaches us when we have fallen and pulls us up because he has us in the grip of his grace. There's a good old-fashioned Hebrew word for that. It's called kesin, or I actually pronounced kesin, uh, but it's a guttural pronunciation. It doesn't matter because I'm sure you've not heard of it, but I love it. It is the grip of his grace. It's that grace that will never let you go. That is a profound protection. But also, um, a reminder... In addition to having a vice grip of grace, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand, verses 5 and 6. He is a protective refuge day and night. Yes, spiritually, because we live in a combat zone. Spiritual warfare is real right here in Chunky, Mississippi. And I don't want to be one of those that says, well, there are demons everywhere. There's one right under that chair. No, I'm not suggesting that, but that's not to say that they're not here. And that means that the, the spiritual darkness of this age and of the principalities and the powers are not arrayed against this church. Of course they are. Because the devil wants to see this church to fail and to go belly up. Okay? That's what the, that's what the devil would love to see happen. Or for this church to compromise and, and go with the flow of the world and pack out every pew but not be faithful to the Word of God. The devil would like that too. And therefore, we have to, to be on the alert. But the good news is, is that we can be. We're not in this by ourselves. We have the very armor of God. He is, the, he is our refuge. When those uh, troubles and those trials come against you, adversity is up in your face. You have a ready refuge day or night. In the spiritual, the emotional, the mental, even, I believe, in the, in the, in the physical, as God provides Sometimes uh, I've had those down times where I've gone as far as I can go and, and you just kind of shut down. And in those moments, the Lord has just allowed me to catch my breath and be able to, to rest maybe for an hour, rest for a couple of hours and be able to, to get, get back into that zone. He does not allow your foot to slip. He is your keeper, the shade at your right hand. It's like that cabin at the racetrack, the picture we had just a moment ago. Back in the day, oh, it was hot. 
I don't know, it's always been hot at the Neshoba County Fair. I don't remember a time, <laughs> even when I was little. 50 years ago, 1974, uh, when we were there, my mom and I were there, uh, that was before we had any of the nice amenities that you would uh, associate with some of the cabins today. It was rough, it was raw, it was hot, but apparently I didn't die. Uh, nowadays, I'd be, you know, where's my sweet tea, where's my lemonade, where's my water, uh, and everything. But it was nice in the heat of the day, because I would, when I was young, I wanted to go, 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 go. I wanted to go to the, uh, to the Midway and, and be on the rides. Yes, I used to ride all the rides, not now. But uh, back then, I was a little bit uh, crazier and, and was willing to do all that. Wanted to play all the games, spend all the money. And then I also loved to walk up and down all the different avenues of the, of the Neshoba County Fair, the different, uh, the different, the try to get the different cabins, some of which had family members, cousins, others, we just didn't know who they were. Mississippi's giant house party. Well, at some point in time in the heat of the day, you know, my mom was about to stroke out. She's hot. And I'm not too far behind her, so she would say, we, we can do the rest of this this evening, okay? Uh, let's save some of it to do tonight uh, when it's a little bit hotter and, and a little bit more fun. That's when some of the uh, country music acts would come or some of the other uh, uh, groups would be there. But it was <laughs> nice to be able to have a place to go and, and uh, get out of the, of the heat of the day, a place to, to have that shade, whether it's on the porch, which is where everybody hung out on the, on the balcony porch, or because I got tired of my cousins, I'd go hang out on the bottom porch because uh, nobody wanted to be down there. I'd go down there. I had more fun because why? I was away from them. But that's just me. Uh, I'm sure if they're watching, I'll hear about it one day. But with that said, um, it was also nice to have a place to lay your head at night so that you know some of the rowdier people would walk by. And I'm not going to go into those details. Let's just say that some people had a lot more fun than others uh, should probably have had, and, and it could get a little rowdy, even as they walked by, uh, front, in, in front of the cabin along that racetrack area. But those doors, would, my grandmother, she, she had deadbolts. I mean, you, I kid you not, chains and deadbolts on that entire door, and she slept on a, on a cot by the door. Was it nobody getting past her? Even when some of my cousins who were older would come in past their <clears throat> curfew, they learned how to climb up a tree that was, here's the balcony, and the tree went right beside it, and they learned how to shimmy up and down the thing. She <coughs> um, my mom caught me trying to shimmy up or shimmy down, and, and that wasn't pleasant either uh, because I was too young to be climbing uh, like a chimpanzee. However, you know, monkey see, monkey do. But it was nice to have a place to lay your head at night and know that you were relatively not going to say it. How do we apply that? We have one who is our rest. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. And this applies to us in the way that he has his grip of grace on you and me every day. He does not allow us to slip. When we do fall, if we do fail, that grip has us. It's a vice grip of grace. He continually watches over. He surveils us. Constant watch. It's better than any sophisticated security system because you know that he sees the real situation and he has you covered. He shelters you. He's right beside you, always with you, a ready refuge, protecting you so that in all things, no matter what they may be, on the spiritual side or in the uh, physical side or somewhere in between, you and I, can be more than conquerors. So I just wanted to give you that snapshot from Wednesday night. However, in that same psalm, as we have looked at it, Psalm 121, as, as David uh, has written, uh, led by the Holy Spirit, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. We are shown that the Lord is a personal protector. It's not just the, on the corporate level, although it very much is. But the writer of the psalm, I, I believe it's David, but it could be one of the others. That's true, too. He says, the Lord, you know, in essence, I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Personal. Sometimes uh, we treat the Lord as if he is a, uh, an impersonal force, and he's not. Sometimes we treat the Lord as if he's a grandfather figure, and he's certainly not. He is on the throne. He is, he is the king. He is the almighty but he is most personal. He intervened in a personal and individual way in the life of Abraham when he called him out 
of his native land, the land of Ur of the Chaldees. Basically, he says, listen, I want you to go to a land that you've never seen. I'm going to make of you a great uh, person. I'm going to make you a great nation, a great family, a great land. And, and just go. Abraham, who was Abram at the time, had not been given an itinerary. He had not been given a list. He just was told, go, and ask us, trust me on it. And he followed. He made, in the language of the Old Testament, in Hebrew, basically, Abraham, by faith, makes tracks with God, going to the promised land based on nothing more than the promise of God. That's faith, people. That is where you are putting your faith in a personal protector to get you there. And Abraham had problems. He had, some, he had some ups and downs. He had some detours. But at the end of the day, he was there. God had protected him and prospered him along the way. The same is true in the, the life of, of Isaac. Okay, uh, It is certainly true in the life of Jacob as God intervened in, in a very personal way. And then not only establishing a covenant with Abraham, but then expanding that covenant with the entire nation of Israel under the time of Moses. <laughs> Personally, relating to his people. Not, not relating to the Israelite people or to Moses and Aaron as, say, the federal government of America would relate to you and me as this impersonal uh, bureaucracy. You must do the you know, tax time, April 17th, uh, always a, a wonderful time, uh, you know, uh, where it's very impersonal sometimes, or sometimes it's a little too personal. It depends on, I guess, where you fall on that uh, spectrum. But however, with that said, uh, God did not relate to them as some impersonal God who says, do this, do that, or I will strike you down, but rather in that covenant relationship. It is a personal relationship where God had obligated himself. I find that to be quite encouraging because we are part of the new covenant that has been effected or put into place by Jesus. His shed blood. His death on the cross. Paying the penalty. His resurrection and empty tomb that means that whosoever can will. And that is great assurance. Each individual, even though part of the whole, they could benefit because God was their personal protector. God committed himself to personally protecting his people. He protected them from uh, outside threats and the hazards of others. Time doesn't permit to talk about some of the various enemies. But looking at one or two, early on, I mean, we're not even really uh, out of Egypt well. And will, they will encounter the Amalekites who will attack them uh, kind of like a, a rear guard because they didn't take them on in a head-on conflict. They did a terrorist attack. They hit where the, the older and the, and the younger and the weaker were in the back. And God says, in essence, I will have war with Amalek and I will wipe them out off the face of the earth. And God did. God did it over time. But he personally protected Israel from being annihilated. Think about it. Coming up out of, of Egypt, they had been a slave race for 430 plus years. They were not a warrior trained race. In fact, God led them the way that he led them. The easier way would have gone by the way of the Mediterranean Sea, but it would have taken them into Philistine territory, which would not have been good. Because the Philistines, they lived the war. I mean, they were militaristic people. And that would have probably been all that Israel needed. So, okay, we're gone. I, I'm out of here. And yet, God took them the long way. He took them, yes, to maybe a, a harder way. But it was a way that protected them from their enemies, the, the potential enemies, the Philistines. Not, not to mention, while they're in the desert, the, the Amalekites. And the list goes on and on. We can talk about the Assyrian Empire, the Babylonians. But one of the things that I'm reminded of is that God protected his people even from themselves. You see, sometimes you and I are our own worst enemy. Oh, we, we want to blame the devil for everything and we give him way too much credit. We, we do our own self and injustice a lot of times. A lot of times through our own faithlessness or sometimes through our own disobedience uh, and, and sinful choices and actions, we bring about consequences uh, we, we can shoot ourselves in the foot. There are times where I know in my own personal life, God has, has saved me from myself. I have looked at myself in the mirror and said, I have met the enemy and he's me. Oh God, save me from me. Uh, not worried about the devil at this point. To save me from myself so that I'm not self-destructive or, 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 or whatever that case may be. For one example, 
even when they were in a fearful state. The 12 spies had gone into the land of Canaan. They had done a intelligence gathering, a mission trip, if you will. Uh, 40 days they were in a land, and it was everything God had said. It was a land flowing with milk and honey. They, they even brought back clusters of grapes from Eshcol. Oh, a beautiful situation. And 10 of the spies were like, yeah, it's good, but always be aware of the buts. But we saw great wall cities. We saw the anarchy. We saw giants. There be monsters here, and we are going to die. Now, I paraphrase that and over the top dramatic. I did that on purpose. But that's kind of the essence. And so 10 of the spies bring the entire group of Israelites to a point of panic and despair that they're wanting to go back to Egypt. Better to be a slave than to be dead. They said, our children, uh, our, our, our little ones, if they're not eaten, if they're not killed, the, the, they will be taken. And God was not happy with the Israelites on that. Now, Joshua and Caleb, they're like, no, no, yeah, we're going to have to fight. I, what did you think was going to happen? Uh, you know, but God goes, well, if God is for us, who can be against us? However, God did intervene. He was willing to wipe out Israel in that moment because of their faithless unbelief and start over with Moses. However, God allowed Moses to intervene. God allowed Moses to be uh, the one who stood in the breach, representing, you might say, uh, the people before God and God before the people in terms of that covenant relationship. And although that entire generation would come under, with the exception of Joshua and Caleb, would come under God's uh, discipline or judgment, and they would spend the next 40 years in that wilderness they were not allowed to cross over, but their children and grandchildren, who they said would be taken or would be destroyed, it was that generation that God also graciously allowed to grow up, protecting them in that wilderness experience so that when their moment came and they're standing at the water's edge of the Jordan after Moses has repeated uh, the law of God in the book of Deuteronomy. And on, you have the two mountains where you have the blessings and you also have the curse and where he challenges the next generation. Choose life. Always, by the way, choose life. Always choose life. God is the God of life, not the God of death. And that generation chose to trust and obey. And they got to walk through uh, the Jordan River that had been parted and walled up. And they walked through not on muddy ground, they walked through on bone dry ground just like they had done at the Red Sea. God had protected them rather than allow them to be annihilated by His wrath. God is a gracious God. Now, He can judge and, and He can discipline. He can punish and it can be severe. It can be painful. But even in that, He stayed true to that covenant. He was their personal protector even in those situations. Or I think about when King Asa, one of the, one of the great kings, several great kings of the southern kingdom of Judah, uh, Asa who brought about uh, some amazing reforms, not long after he has become king and has begun to begin some uh, religious reforms, uh, bringing the people back to, to a worship and a focus on Jehovah God, his faith is challenged. The military uh, side of it is his army has to go up against, uh, if I can pronounce that man's name, yes, General Zara of what was then known as Ethiopia. Maybe not the Ethiopia of today, but they, what they called Ethiopia back in those days, who came against the Israelites 100,000 strong. And they met in the valley of Zapatha at Marashah. And General Zera intended to annihilate. There was not going to be a, a negotiate uh, unless he's going to accept surrender. And obviously he would prefer to fight than accept a surrender. And so Asa has a moment. And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord. Our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. 
So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. Second Chronicles 14, 11, and 12. Asa had a personal relationship with Jehovah God. By grace, through faith, same as you and I today. That was personal then. But how might it be personal tonight? Think about every instance, each and every instance in, in your private life or in your family life or in this corporate church life. Every time that you have been protected, every time that you have been helped, every time that you have been delivered or healed, that's not chance. That's not coincidence. I do not believe in coincidence. I believe in providence. There is no such thing as coincidence. It's not just your self-effort or ability, although you do have a responsibility for yourself. At the end of the day, and behind it all, is that presence of the Lord God. God who is in Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, who is God for us. It is He who has been there and who is our personal protector. Our God is the God of victories. The Almighty Lord is our escape from death. Psalm 68 verse 20 in the God's Word translation. For you have delivered my soul from death and my feet from stumbling that I may walk before God in the light of life. Psalm 56 13. So many times and I can share from my personal life and, and I would like to think that you can uh, connect with that. But how many times I have been protected personally from distractions that might would have uh, taken me in, a, in, a, in another direction that would have dishonored God or disqualified me or, or in, in taken me in a, in a path that was not uh, what I needed to be at that time or do what I needed to do. I may never know how many times God has been uh, in Christ and in the indwelling Holy Spirit every time I have been walking where I could have easily stepped off uh, and, and because of a personal distraction or whatever distraction life might throw. How many times He's had a grip of grace just sometimes gently bringing me back, or other times yanking me back. I remember one time uh, with my daughter when she was younger, uh, you know, I, I had to, you know, I, I don't know if it was, uh, I don't know if we were going across the street or something, it probably was. I had a vice grip on her, or her arm. I didn't want anything to happen. That was always my worst fear. Something would happen to her. And so, you know, there was one occasion where I yanked her back because I would rather it hurt for a moment than for her to get hit. Okay, uh, so yes, God, there have been many times where he has yanked me back, and I thank him for that. What about your life? The times that he has personally protected you from distractions, or personally protected you from disasters, not just tornadoes and storms, although that's part of it. But what about those disasters are sometimes self-made? You know, those things that could have been uh, terribly, uh, ended terribly one way or the other so many times. So many times in my life, without going into detail, I was, I remember many years ago, about 30 years, almost 30 years ago, I uh, had a, a situation where I uh, had a, um, I guess you would say a misunderstanding and a, a parting of the ways with an individual, and I wanted to tell that person how I felt, quite emphatically. And I, I was, I, called, I picked that phone up and I was going to let him have it. I never could get through to it. Every time I tried, God shut me down. And at some point, I'm like, okay, Lord, you have my undivided attention. And at that point, as I began to read the scripture and pray, the Lord's like, you need to shut your mouth. You need to tone it down about 5,000 RPM. And then you need to back off and walk away because vengeance is mine, not yours. Yes, Lord, I hear you. How many times has the Lord saved and protected you from yourself? As we apply this tonight, are you depending on the Lord for that personal protection tonight because He is that personal protector? Or are you trying to put up a brave and bold front? Just like the U.S. Secret Service, each one that is on presidential detail, uh, they are personally trained and therefore prepared to place themselves in harm's way for the president. Not because of the man or eventually maybe one day the woman, but rather for the office that it represents. The Lord is our personal protector, but he's also our personal protector because he loves us as a person. And then last but not least, the Lord is a powerful protector. 
In the Old Testament, the Lord protected His people by restraining the power of the enemy. They were only allowed to go so far and they were only allowed to do so much. The Assyrians, when they uh, basically conquered the northern kingdom, and yes, they forced the, uh, many of the people to, to relocate to different, distant lands, and therefore, uh, even to this day, their, their tribal uh, identity is still uh, garbled. But the day is coming when the Messiah will sort that out. But even then, God did not allow the Assyrians to do any more than what He chose to let them do. Babylon was allowed to dominate the southern kingdom <coughs> because God was tired of the idolatry. He was tired of their uh, rebellion. And so God allowed King Nebuchadnezzar and those that came after him until the fall of the Babylonian Empire. God allowed them to dominate the life of Israel, a, a very painful uh, period but one in which after they had been corrected, after they had been purified, they had been uh, purged of, of what they had been doing, then God brought an end to the Babylonians. And He raised up the Persians that allowed them to be able to go home. The king's heart is a waterway in the hand of the Lord. He directs it wherever He pleases. Proverbs 21.1 Jacob, who fled after having basically stolen uh, everything from his brother. Uh, not only did he get him to sell the birthright, but also he got the, stole the blessing. Uh, Esau is not happy, and so uh, his mother now has to basically let her son go, and I don't know if he ever saw his mother again or not. I'd have to go back and look on that. And as he's fleeing from the wrath, because basically Esau says, when dad dies, I'm taking you down. Now, maybe not quite that plain, but that's the emphasis. And so as he flees, the he has a time where he has an encounter with God. God reveals himself to Jacob in a very personal way, but also a very powerful way. Over time, he disciplines Jacob. He, he polishes those rough edges. He also delivers Jacob. He transforms him so that after about 20 years, the supplanter now becomes the prince with God having prevailed with God, although it cost him. I think he walked with a, with a limp in his hip for the remainder of his life, but he was a different person. God powerfully operated in his life. No pun intended. Genesis 28, 15. Look, I am with you, and I will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, meaning Canaan, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Just four points as we think about that. It's power to effect. When we think about a, a powerful protector, power to effect, S E F F E C T, effect. What does that mean? To make it happen. Even if it seems impossible or illogical, God can make it happen. Power to embolden. He takes the tame and he takes the timid and he makes them bold and courageous. Think about Gideon. Gideon, who, uh, when God called him, I mean, basically, he. I always picture Gideon, just bear with me for a minute. I picture Gideon as the, as the Barney Fife of the Old Testament, okay? Uh, if you've ever watched any Andy Griffith and, and Barney Fife, you know he's not the, the paragon of, of, of courage all the time. And yet, God took Gideon and turned him into an amazing judge leading Israel. Power to affect, that is A-F-F-E-C-T. That is, to influence hearts and minds and circumstances and conditions that already exist and direct it in a way that will bring Him the greatest glory and you the greatest good. Power to assure that He will be with you, that He is for you. God goes with you. God goes before you. He goes beside you. He's behind you. And through the person and power of the Holy Spirit, He is within you. I say that's a very powerful protection. So as we wrap that up for tonight, how does that power relate to us right now? There are at least three implications, I think. His protective power can propel. That is pushing forward. See, sometimes the natural tendency is just to remain static. We get comfortable. We get complacent. And we just want to sit down and, and you know, just take it easy. 
and, and just let life, you know, let's just go with the flow. Well, sometimes sitting down and taking it easy may be the worst thing that you can do spiritually. It may be a dangerous thing because if you're not progressing, if you're not moving forward, you're stagnating. If you're stagnating, eventually you're declining. And so his personal and powerful protection can actually propel you forward. And I find that to be a glorious thing. But a second implication his personal and powerful protection can promote, that is, enable you to become, enable you to be and to do what He has created you to do and has created you to be in Him. That promotes life and joy and blessing when we're achieving our potential. Which brings us to the third implication. We can prosper you. Protected then you can trust the Lord. Protected, you can obey the Lord. Protected, then you are able to be and do and as a result experience the blessing of the Lord here and now. So tonight, as we close, as we come to the most important moment, which is the invitation, as our worship leaders come, as we stand and sing our hymn of invitation, how might the Lord need, uh, how might you need the Lord to be that personal and powerful protector for you tonight? The altar is open and I invite you to come. He is very personal, not just impersonal, but very personal. And he's not just powerful, he's all powerful. You come tonight as the Lord leads you tonight.